Well, good morning. My name is Pastor Phil, and it is an honor to, to share God's Word with you today. We have just gone through a sermon series, an entire sermon series titled Follow Me, where we looked at, at the apostles, the first 12 apostles, Peter, James, John, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, James the Lesser, and even Judas Iscariot. We dug into their lives and we, we started trying to uncover things and started trying to figure out who they were and, and, and what, they're, what they were doing so we could try to figure out, okay, how does that affect me and, and how am I going to move forward in my walk with Christ? I know next week Pastor Tim's going to be touching base on, on our pursuit of discipleship as these guys start teaching everybody to become disciples of Jesus. But today, today I want to talk about the rest of the story. The rest of the story. You see, I was a little guy with my three brothers, and we'd be going along in our, our blue Chevy Capri Classic station wagon. Some of you remember those? We'd be on our way to our standard summer vacation for some fishing up in Hayward, Wisconsin. And with four boys, we were screaming and yelling and kicking and fighting. We were all the way in the back to all the way in the front, sitting on mom's lap. There were no seatbelts. And we survived. But for whatever reason, when a particular broadcast came over the radio waves, the six of us would hush. Now, we weren't even having to be told to stop talking or stop kicking. We just wanted to listen. There was a program that came on the radio. No, a broadcaster, a Hall of Famer. His name was Paul Harvey. Some guys in the AV booth didn't know who Paul Harvey was. <laughs> Did you listen to Paul Harvey? Uh-huh. You know, he, his voice was captivating, not just because of his rich tone, but because of the stories he told. He, he would take, there, he had a segment in, in his news broadcast where he would take a, a unique way of diving into something that we were super familiar with. Like, like he, he looked at, uh, he, one time he, he shared a story about Coca-Cola, and he talked about its founding and, and how it started off as a medicine, and then before the movie The Founder came out, where we learned about McDonald's, he took the story of the two brothers who founded McDonald's before Ray Kroc was anything in the picture. And, and he would just weave these things in, bring in new light, and then at the end, he would nail us with the r realization of what he was actually talking about. And it was in a segment called The Rest of the Story. So today... We're not going to end our exploration of the apostles. We're just going to take the next step. We're going to continue our journey in this brand new church age that we are reading in Scripture. We see that the, the apostles, the original 12, they laid a foundation of how to spread the gospel to all the world thanks to the teachings of Jesus. Jesus. But we see that there are some in the background, some very faithfully serving people. There were some others that were waiting for a dramatic life change. Today we're going to go beyond the well-trodden path to embrace like a, a fuller, a fuller narrative of our early church. So in the same way that Paul Harvey would introduce someone Allow me to introduce you to two men, two men that we're going to be talking about today in my own segment of the rest of the story. In the days when miracles painted the landscapes of Judea and the air was thick with hope and tension, there were men who walked closely with the carpenter turned Messiah. Twelve were at the forefront. Their name's etched in history, but our tale today weaves around two others. One, ever-present, yet not always in the limelight, 
His presence, a gentle whisper in the grand narrative. The other, a figure of contrast. His shadow looming on the horizon, awaiting a destiny intertwined with the divine mission. The first man, hailing from a humble family and blessed with unassuming grace, he walked the dusty trails with Jesus. Though not a man of many words, his heart bore the imprint of unwavering faith. Among the chosen 72 sent out by Jesus, he witnessed miracles and stood beside the Jordan River as the heavens opened. In a gathering filled with awe and wonder, he was part of the assembly that broke bread with the resurrected Jesus. He was a silent servant whose role was paramount, yet uncelebrated. He was strong and steadfast, but he was a shadow behind the twelve. The second figure, the second figure was a storm in the distance, a force of zeal and righteousness. Born in Tarsus and steeped in Jerusalem's teachings, his law education made him a formable scholar. His enthusiasm knew no bounds. His mission was clear and relentless. Through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, he hunted those who followed the crucified one, his eyes ablaze with purpose. Yet, a moment in Dama on the Damascus Road, where heaven met earth, transformed this relentless persecutor into a passionate proclaimer of faith. So who were these two pivotal figures? Well, by the sovereignty of the Almighty, the first was chosen to be, become the twelfth apostle, teaching countless souls about the way. This man, Matthias, filled the void when one of the original twelve faltered. The other, a Pharisee among Pharisees, would later take the name Paul, and in a divine twist of fate, he became the last to take the position of an apostle. And now you know the rest of the story. Wait, the story's just beginning. The story's just beginning. You see, just imagine, we're, we'll, we'll deal with Matthias first. Just imagine that you were part of something absolutely transformative that, that was gonna, gonna change the course of history of all time and yet you always remained in the shadows. You weren't loud and crazy like Peter and John and James. You just faithfully followed Jesus. You didn't take the center stage. That's why I call Matthias the silent servant. The silent servant. Now, we really don't know how much Matthias spoke or didn't speak or how much he listened or didn't listen. Scripture doesn't tell us that. Matthias is only mentioned in one portion of Scripture. In all of the Bible, they talk about the 12th Apostle in one section. Acts chapter 1, verse 23 says, And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Then in Acts 1 26, it says, And they, referring to the other 11 apostles, and they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias. And he was numbered with the 11 apostles. Now, we're not going to go into great detail, friends, about what casting lots means. We can go into great detail about that. If you want, check out Proverbs 16.33 if you want a reference for another time. Bottom line, Matthias was chosen to be the 12th apostle. It was absolutely through the sovereignty of God. When, when Judas betrayed Jesus and then Judas committed suicide... Matthias was the person who filled the position. Matthias was the embodiment of quiet dedication. During Jesus' ministry, he wasn't always the standout figure, but he was always there, silently serving, faithfully following. Think of that, silently serving and faithfully following. Sometimes we want to make sure everybody knows what we're doing. Let's post it on social media. Let, let's tell, tell our friends about what we did or, or how we did it. Matthias didn't put one thing on Facebook. I guarantee that. <laughs> like the unsung heroes in many of our personal stories, he humbly served without the need for recognition. His belief was steadfast, and his commitment was unwavering. 
Acts chapter 1 tells us that Matthias served Jesus. He was with Jesus from the moment he was baptized all the way to the resurrection. Now, just a side note for you guys. In Revelation chapter 21, verse 14, you can write that note down. Revelation 21, 14. Here's what it says. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations. This is talking about uh, the New Jerusalem. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I believe that when we witness the new earth and the new Jerusalem, on that 12th foundation, the name Matthias is going to be there. Now, I can't find that in Scripture specifically. It's just my belief. Matthias is not a name that jumps off the pages. It's not a name we have tons of information with, but we should resonate with it. We should resonate with this story that he has. He wasn't seeking fame or attention. He just served God. Just a quiet dedication, unwavering faith. It's believed that Matthias, that he took the gospel far and wide. In my research of Matthias, uh, one of the places that he, it's believed he went to is Ethiopia. And, and then he died a martyrdom's death, according to history. Proverbs 19.21 tells us that many are the plans in a person's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And Matthias lived that truth. Matthias lived it. He, he, he waited. He served. And when God called, he was ready. He was ready. So here's what I want to ask you today. So if you're sleeping right now, these are three questions I want to ask you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Doesn't matter if you're 58 years old. God may have something for you right now that you're supposed to start, you're supposed to do. Are you ready? Second question, are you, are you serving faithfully even when no one else sees? We love doing things that people can see. Right back to social media. What are you doing that no one else is seeing? When no one else is looking, when you're in that front room at your home, how are you serving Jesus even in that moment? What are you doing? And then third thing, are we prepared to take action when God calls, even if it's not glamorous? I remember my friend Bill Griffith over at the Indian Creek campus. I'd be studying in my office. Pastor Jeremy's here right now on his sabbatical. Good to see you, Pastor Jeremy. He's over at the Indian Creek campus as the pastor there, and he's probably witnessed this many times. Bill Griffith, in his mid-70s, cleaning toilets and whistling. Just a beautiful sound. What a way to, to work on your study as you see a, a man who's just faithful. And he'd be whistling if I wasn't there because he's faithfully serving. Before becoming a full-time pastor here, I had the honor to serve in education for over two decades. I started off as a youth pastor at a couple different churches, but then I, I became a PE teacher. And then I was uh, in the district office working on technology. Then I went, and I was an assistant principal, then a principal, and, and then I had the pleasure of becoming a, a superintendent at three different Christian schools. When I took the position of pastor at Indian Creek, and I was part-time there, I went and sought an opportunity to be a full-time substitute teacher. I ended up going to Fairmont schools in Lockport. Very, very poor school district. 
lots of activity and lots of action. My goal, my role as the full-time sub was I, I was caring for the preschool through eighth grade students. That's pretty large. I would help kids navigate classrooms, hallways, on the playground, in the gym. My first year there, I was assigned the lunchroom every day. I had the pleasure of serving kindergartners. I helped them open their milks. Why can't they make that easier? And, and, and trying to keep the chaos down. That was, my, that was my job. And I remember two, about two months into being at Fairmont School District, I was getting a little anxious. The kids were a little rowdy in that lunchroom. And then Tommy, he opened his milk, must not have needed my help, opened his chocolate milk, probably a Prairie Farms chocolate milk, and he just poured it on the floor. I mean, I literally watched him do it. <laughs> that was fun. Let me go get a wad of paper towels, and I walk over, get the paper towels, and I grab the huge wad of paper towels. You do that before you go get the mop. I got down on my hands and knees, and as the chocolate milk was going underneath the chairs with the little kids kicking their legs, I literally thought to myself, what in the world am I doing? With, with my degree... And my resume, I am down here cleaning up milk. But then, maybe you've had this moment in time. I know exactly where I was at at Fairmont. I can go to that, almost that tile that I was at. The Holy Spirit grabbed my heart and said, because you get to. This is a moment in time that you get to be here. I was knocked upside the head, like, wow. My whole perspective changed at that moment. What an opportunity I had to be there. I didn't realize it, but six of my children would come from that school that I didn't even know yet. So if I would have just thrown it out because I thought I was too good for it, I wouldn't have had any opportunity for those children. Here's a quote for you. God doesn't care if you have a PhD or a GED. He wants, you to, he wants to use you for his glory. It doesn't matter how smart you are, friends. Frankly, he doesn't care. He just wants you to serve him. He wants you to have an opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. Otherwise, why in the world are we here? Just for fun? No, we're here to get trained so we can go to the next step to, to share the good news with the next person. So let's just not admire Matthias' faith. Let's emulate it. Let's emulate it. Let's be quiet heroes in our community. Quiet heroes in our family. Quiet heroes right here in church. Let's be the ones who stand ready for God's call no matter where it leads. No matter where it leads. Okay, let's, let's turn our attention to another figure. Another figure whose life was turned upside down by God's call. So in contrast to our deduction of Matthias's quiet spirit, the man Saul, well, he wasn't the whispering type. He was loud. So we shift our focus to Paul, the Pharisee to preacher. Now, when, when, I, when I looked at this message, and about a week and a half ago, I mean, I was, I was down a whole nother message, and about a week and a half ago, I'm like, I don't think that's the message I'm supposed to be preaching on 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'm like, okay, God, where am I supposed to go? And as it was re being revealed to me, I'm like, I'm going to teach about the next two apostles 
the 12th apostle and the final one to take the position of the apostles. Then I'm like, wait a minute. Well, we have nothing on Matthias, and we have everything on Paul. We have tons of stuff on Paul. We can spend months just tipping at that iceberg on Paul. But I don't have much time. So I'm just going to give you a kind of an overview of who Paul was. Because we need to get to the rest of the story. Paul was born in Tarsus. He was an educated uh, under some of the finest teachers. I mean, man was brilliant. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees. He knew his stuff. He knew his stuff. And you know what? He was on fire for what he believed. Have you ever met somebody who was just absolutely on fire for what they believed? Maybe, maybe it's a, a type of car, or it's a particular restaurant, or, or it's a, a type of shoe you wear. Oh, I only wear these. They're on fire, and they're telling everybody about it. He was on fire, but on the wrong path. He, he was just going the wrong direction. He was persecuting the church. It was recorded in Acts 8.3. Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. I mean, he loved it. He thought he was doing God's work. And he thought he needed to do God's work because he needed to keep achieving, keep moving forward, keep doing things. Keep working for God only because that was his way toward salvation. But you know what? The Lord specifically chose Paul to become the apostle of the Gentiles, as he's called. So that one day we could know Jesus here in Sugar Grove, Illinois. We could know Jesus wherever you're at online. You see, on a journey to Damascus, Paul, he encountered Jesus himself. He encountered Jesus himself. He, he was going to Damascus to go, go fight, go beat people up, go imprison them when they were following Jesus. Here's what it says. Acts 9, 3 through 5. Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Paul said to him, Who are you, Lord? And Jesus said, I am Jesus, the one you are persecuting. You see, Paul moved from being a persecutor to becoming one of the most prominent preachers of all time. His life just exemplified grace. That's what grace is. He didn't deserve this. But God said, I'm calling you. Paul didn't deserve to be saved. But he got to. Paul's life shows this grace, and, and he started preaching to the synagogues, the marketplaces, and to the intellectuals in Athens. Again, we can go on and on about who Paul is. His, he, had a, he had a tough journey because you know what? Everybody saw Paul and they thought of Saul. And that's what you guys experience, because I know I do. You experience the, the effect of everyone remembers your past, who you were. They remember the guy who cheated, they remember the person who committed adultery. They remember the person who, who screamed at me, who cussed me out. We, we have a tough time recognizing when people are in Christ that we stop seeing who they used to be and understanding who they are in now. And we need to start changing that reflection so that we are not hampered. If they're not following Jesus Christ, well, they're not following Jesus Christ. That's a choice. They're not supposed to live a certain way. But when they start following Jesus, praise Jesus. So Paul had to, had to defend himself multiple times. One time, he, he even corrected 
Peter, the top apostle. Peter, he, he got anxious with the Judaites and the whole story I could tell you on that. And, and, and so he said, oh yeah, yeah, don't eat with the Gentiles. Don't eat with, with, with the people that aren't, aren't Jewish. Yeah, don't eat with them. Uh, yeah, that's what God says. Well, that's not what, what was being taught. That was already decided. Jesus wanted them to preach to the Gentiles, and so, so, so Paul confronted Peter. And you fast forward in Galatians chapter 2, and it gets to uh, Galatians 2.20, and that's when Paul says, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. The life I live in the flesh, I live through faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. Do you understand what he's saying here? It, it, it's not about him. It's all about Jesus. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus. Paul wasn't the only person in scriptures. Probably don't have to tell you, you guys are smart. You know these things. There's a lot of magnificent redemption stories in scriptures. I could pull out a handful of them. Uh, let's, let's explore a couple of them. Paul, we, we already know he was a persecutor to a preacher. He, he had a, a compelling story that is just amazing to see. Acts 9 says Paul was, was a chosen instrument of Jesus to carry the name before the Gentiles, to carry the name before kings and, and, and the children of Israel. From persecutor to preacher. How about King David? He was a murderer. He became known as the man after God's own heart. He looked upon Bathsheba. It's described in 2 Samuel. And he looked at her with lust, and, and, and then he had her come over, and, and he eventually got her pregnant. So he had to get, bring in her husband, try to, try to get them to be together. He wouldn't do it. So he sent her husband, who was one of, one of the generals, out into the front to basically go die so he could cover up the sin. King David went a whole different direction. But you know what it says in Psalm 51? This is, this is David crying out, Create in me a clean heart, O God. That, that's what you need to be saying. Create in me a clean heart. That's what I, I said this morning. Create in me a clean heart, God. I want to be faithful to your word. I want to be faithful to what I'm doing here. I want to be faithful to, to, to my wife and to my children. To honor you in each of those things. And then Mary Magdalene, she had seven demons. And we see how she, she, she be, was from demon-possessed to, to one of the most devoted disciples that Jesus had. She was with Jesus when he was being crucified. She was one of the first to see him be resurrected. And let's not forget the thief on the cross. Moving from criminal to convert. He's on the cross. He's done for. He's dead. He's as good as dead. Dead man, not walking, dead man hanging. He's done for. And yet he says in Luke 23, when he started humbling himself, and just, wow, oh my goodness, Jesus is the Lord. He said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Isn't that what we should be asking? Maybe you've already asked that. That's a good thing to ask. Jesus, will you remember me? Will you remember me? You know what Jesus' answer? Truly, truly, I say to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. That's a good, that's something good to hear. It, it demonstrates that it's, you're never too late. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, it's not too late. But it might be on your way home. 
So whether we find ourselves lost like the prodigal son, burdened like Zacchaeus, or even at the end of the rope, like the thief on the cross, the message of redemption in Scripture is absolutely clear. God's love can reach us. God's love can change us. God's love can bring us into his eternal kingdom. It's a message that continues to inspire us. It should comfort us. It should challenge us. Just like Paul said over and over and over in his epistles that he was in Christ, that Christ was in him. That's what we need to be reflecting. These stories of of Matthias and Paul, they're, they're remarkable individuals. All these apostles are remarkable. Uh, the, these, these stories are interwoven into the, to the narrative of Jesus. And they only reveal some glimpses of faith. Uh, help us to see the perseverance, the transformation that these guys had. But you know what? They're only threads. Tiny threads to the tapestry of the whole story of God. The story of redemption and salvation and eternal love finds its center not in any one person like you and me. Not in any great deed that was done. It only finds its purpose in Jesus. Because Christ is, is, is not merely a part of the story. He is the rest of the story. He is the whole story. You see, when we trace the lives of the apostles and the prophets and, and all the disciples, all the faithful followers, we discover that all roads lead to Jesus. Everything leads to Jesus. The baby in, uh, in Bethlehem, the teacher by the seaside, the healer of the sick, the one who broke bread with sinners, the Savior on the cross. Every act, every miracle, every word spoken, it was not an isolated event. It was part of a much bigger picture. It was the grand narrative that culminates in the redemption of humanity. Friends, we need to reflect on our own walks with Jesus, on our own journeys, on the legacy that we hope to leave behind. Because we need to remember that, that our ultimate purpose is to point people to Jesus. To live a life that is worthy to point people to Jesus. Our lives are just a brief chapter. Only one life soon will pass. Only what's done for Christ will last. We have an opportunity to, to make an impact. I don't think you're getting this. Let me drive it home a little bit, little bit heavier. Here's a picture of a little guy. I think that's my kindergarten picture. Maybe I poured milk out. Here's, here's the second picture. This is my dad, Dale. He passed away in 2015. How many here know their dad's first name? Raise your hand nice and high if you know your dad's first name. Some people don't. That wasn't super good raising of hands. We'll work on that on the next one. Let's see that next one. Uh, this is my grandpa Russell with his wife Louise. My daughter Molly, who was singing up here, her middle name is Louise. We call her Molly Lou. Grandpa Russell was my favorite. Sorry, Grandpa Stokes. How many people here know their dad's dad's first name? Raise your hand nice and high. Oh, oh, wow, much better contributions. How about this one? This is Hiram Wesley Chapman with his wife, Ella. My daughter, Maddie's Middle name is Ella. This is my great grandpa. He died in 1979. I was born in 1975. 
Now, I, I don't really remember him. I just, I knew his name just because I, I had heard it enough. Enough genealogy going on in my home to know his name. But what about this one? This is also Hiram Wesley Chapman. It was the 11th hour, and I still had in my notes, I got to find his name. I did not know that my great, great grandfather, through my dad's side, was named Hiram Wesley Chapman. How many here know the name of your great, great grandfather's first name? Through your father's side. Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten. Look at this stat. Seventy seven years. My great great grandfather Hiram died around eighteen ninety eight. I, I forgot what the date was. I was born in 1975. 75 years separated us, and I didn't know his name. Are you listening, young people? We are spending so much time on things that we think will last. Make sure that our, our yard is just perfect, make sure that our bank accounts are, are overflowing. We want to make sure our bodies look just the right way. You know what we do? We, we spend countless hours ensuring that our kids are lifting weights or playing the violin or, or, or go to sports camps. Get straight A's. Why? Why are we spending so much energy on those things? If we just take a step back and reflect for a second, and we, we should realize that none of this will last. No one is going to care that your child won that bowling trophy at seven years old. In fact, no one is going to remember your name in 75 to 100 years. And we don't want them to. Who cares? You see, we could have an unbelievable effect on the generations to come 120 years from now if we serve Jesus. And if we tell the next generation all about who Jesus is and we say, dig into God's word. Don't take my word for it. Get in there yourself. Dig into God's word. No matter how old you are, how young you are. It's about Jesus. It's not about you. We, we think way too much of ourselves. We've journeyed through the lives of Matthias and Paul, and we know that they laid a great foundation. Uh, this, this church age, they've, they've really laid a good foundation for us. And these men, they each had unique stories, unique challenges, contributions. But they shared a singular purpose, to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. That was their purpose. They, they did it all the way to death. Their combined efforts, along with countless other people, is why I get to be a believer today. Why you get to be a believer Go ahead, Eric. You could show it. My wife and I along along with these five kiddos. We're going to stand before a judge in just eight days. And 
that judge is going to look at Bradford and Maisie and Jemima and Gigi and Love. And he's going to say, are you ready? Are you ready to officially become a Chapman? After these 2,080 days in foster care, are you ready? And with the swing of a gavel and a hit down, their names become mine. Their birth certificates have sherries of my name on them like they've been our children since they were born. What a responsibility Sherry and I have to raise these children to share the good news with them. But what a responsibility you have to share the good news with them. As a church, what a responsibility our extended family has. Because if we can teach them about Jesus, they can teach their children and their grandchildren. Are you getting what I'm saying? We've explored what it means to be in Christ. We cannot forget that Christ is the rest of the story. For everyone. For everyone. You may not, you may not trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, but someday you will call him Lord. You will bow down to him. Paul reminds us in Philippians that every knee shall bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. No matter where you're at, it's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. So our challenge, our calling, our, is to live out the story. Not for ourselves. Just, just keep sharing it. We get to be part of this grand narrative one day it's going to find its fulfillment in the acknowledgement that Christ is Lord by all. Christ is the Lord. So when we leave here, don't just let this be a message of, of oh, wow, that was fun. Let it be a message of change. Let it transform you. Let, I, I want you to know that you are part of something way more significant something eternal and something that is indeed the rest of the story.